Now after I published a recent video on the rust proofing of this old vehicle, I received very heavy uh, criticism and in rather inappropriate language from one of my viewers who said that my work practices were grossly unsafe and I was setting a very bad example to others. And he quoted three specific points. Firstly, that I left a jack under the vehicle during the work as part of the support system. Secondly, that I was using timber to support the vehicle. And thirdly, that I had a piece of timber under the front brake disc. And he claimed that the vehicle could fall off its support, causing serious injury, or that I could have fatally damaged the brake disc, which would fail unexpectedly, causing a potentially fatal accident. And he further, furthermore went on to suggest that viewers around the world might copy me and so I could be responsible for deaths around the world. Now even though the bloke appeared to have very limited engineering understanding, the fact is you cannot take matters of safety too seriously. And who knows, he could have a point. So in this video, I've taken a very open-minded and critical assessment of the way that I work from an engineering standpoint, and I present the findings. I think they're quite interesting, actually. So let's look at the correct jacking procedure. Well, step one, we chop the wheels on the opposite axle, and ideally on both sides to be extra safe. Step two, take a good strong trolley jack, place it under the axle and jack the wheel up. Step three, take a suitably rated axle stand and place that under the axle next to the trolley jack. Step four, we lower the trolley jack slowly to transfer the weight to the axle stand. Step five, we lower the trolley jack completely and withdraw it. Simple. However, step five is absolutely idiotic. In the trolley jack, you've got a completely independent and suitable means of support. And by taking it away, all we're doing is we are increasing the chance of failure. For example, if the chance of failure of the trolley jack is say 1 in 1000 and chance of failure of the axle stand in, is 1 in 10,000, the chance of them both failing simultaneously is 1 in 10 million. To me it's absolutely stupid to take the jack away, so what I do is I leave it in position, I take away the handle so it can't be accidentally activated and I regard it just as being a composite support system and I'm not too worried about whether the load is actually being taken by the jack or by the axle stand, providing they are both in contact with the axle so it, so it can't drop if either one or the other fails. Vehicle supports. Most widely used solution is the axle stand. It's a very uh, common design, very mature, been around a long time, lightweight. What could be wrong with it? Well, I don't much like them. To me, they aren't inherently robust. And let me explain why. Well, firstly, got triangular shape, and if you lose any of the corners, over she goes. Secondly, they're made up of pressed steel, and actually really not very thick, I guess about two millimetres. The legs have a circular form, and in structural terms it's what you'd call a curved shell. Structurally very efficient, they've got one major failing, and they are prone to buckle, particularly if there's any geometrical imperfection. So if you've got a vehicle on an axial stand, and there's some sort of incident, if the leg gets a whack, if you introduce a local dent there, it's likely to buckle. And finally, the feet aren't very big, are they? And even worse, on this heavy-duty two-ton axle stand, the feet are tiny. Now that's perfectly okay if you've got concrete hard standing like me, but if, if you don't and you're working on, say, a gravel driveway, feet are very likely to punch in and over she goes. So they're perfectly okay if used correctly, but in my opinion, they aren't inherently robust. An alternative solution blocks of timber like this. Now to you this may just be a piece of wood, but I'll use the correct term and that's dunnage. And dunnage is the preferred temporary support in a whole slew of industries, certainly shipping, marine, construction and so forth. 
Now, I was associated with the construction of dozens of offshore platforms over the years. We used dunnage everywhere, and I can't remember a single accident we had owing to the failure of dunnage. So what are the advantages? Well, firstly, you can get whatever load carrying capacity you want. You just add more and more of it. Or you can go to something like green heart timber if you've got really high loads. Secondly, it's inherently robust. So if it's under load and you give it a whack, it's not going to buckle or move out the way. And thirdly, you get much larger ground bearing area. So you can either use it on the concrete hard standing, on a gravel driveway, on grass, whatever. It's not going to punch in. Now almost the biggest advantage is that if you've got a very concentrated load it's going to crush locally and it means that the supported item is going to be cushioned. You aren't going to get a high stress concentration and it's not going to get damaged. So what do I use? I tend to use these for moderate loads, things like axles and gearboxes and so forth, but when I'm supporting the weight of the vehicle I prefer this. We'll do a little experiment. Let's lower the full weight of the axle through the brake disc onto the dunnage and see what happens. And those of you who think that because this is cast iron it's going to shatter into a thousand pieces, cover your ears and look away. I can see that it's sunk well in into the wood and has compressed it. We'll now take it out, we'll measure it out, we'll go inside and analyse what's actually happened. I am now measuring the length of the contact area using a thin steel ruler and a little sharpie. And the answer is 7 centimetres. I'm now going to test the theory that by making the front brake rotor part of the support system when the vehicle was jacked up, I've somehow damaged it fatally and it's going to fail unpredictably, possibly causing a fatal accident. Now the starting point is always to determine what the maximum stresses are in the rotor. I could do this very quickly and very simply. The rotor resting on top of the piece of dun dunnage, that's what's known as the cylinder contact problem. And this was solved decades ago by methods of classical elasticity. I could take formulae out for text like this and I could compute the stresses to good engineering accuracy. Trouble is no one would believe it. They want to see stress plots and computer analysis so that's what I'll do. It's actually using the proverbial sledgehammer to crack a nut. The system I'll be using it's called GT Strudel, marketed by Intergraph Corporation. It's one of the major engineering analysis systems in the world, with a price tag to suit. I paid over five-figure sum for this. However, the advantage is that people aren't really going to be able to question the validity of the results. Now, before you do any computer analysis, you should always do a manual estimate of the results first, so you don't just blindly believe the results coming out of the computer. And I've done a very simple manual calc here. And it really is very simple. We know the maximum applied load, it's not going to be more than 500 kilograms or 4,900 newtons. We know the size of the contact patch, which is 14 millimetres by 70 millimetres, and so we can compute the average pressure acting on the uh, contact area on the disc. However, it's not going to be uniformly applied, and I'm estimating that in the centre it might be 50% greater. Now, looking at the geometry of the brake disc, I don't see any obvious stress raises, so my estimate is that the maximum uh, compressive stress in the disc isn't going to exceed the maximum applied external pressure. So my estimate is ballpark figure 7.5 newtons per square millimetre. We start by creating the geometrical model or what's known as the finite element mesh. Now in this case the model is going to be extremely simple. We've only got to model the rotor itself. On the inner edge it's contiguous with the car steel hub 
which is massive by comparison, and this edge may be regarded as fixed. Also, because of the symmetry, we only need to model one half of the disc, obviously applying the correct boundary conditions down the centre. And this is what the mesh looks like. I've imported the data from the mesh generator into GT Strudel and created the data file. But we need to check it out. We're now inside the rather uninspiring graphics section of GT Strudel showing the model. We've got the boundary conditions here. So the disk is uh, rigidly supported by the hub. We've got the symmetrical boundary conditions on the center line. And at the bottom I show the pressure loading and I've assumed a cosine function for this. I run the analysis and I'm displaying the computed stresses and several points to note. Firstly, the disc is in compression almost everywhere. Tiny little area of small tensile stress there. We got the largest stress concentrations here where the load is applied, but the magnitude isn't very great, exactly as I predicted. We verify the analysis firstly by checking the display shape and then by checking the support reactions. And the total reaction is 2450 newtons, which is one half of 4900, so that's correct. I've also printed out the maximum stresses. First point to note, they're all negative, which means they're in compression. And the largest number I see looking down the column here, that's 7.9. And my initial estimate was 7.5, so I'm satisfied with that. So what does this actually mean? Well, I obviously don't know the exact properties of the cast iron use in the brake rotor, but I think we can assume it was grey cast iron, which is the type which is used for these types of components. And the American Society of Testing and Materials has seven grades of grey cast iron. The weakest is type 20, and the tensile strength is 22 kips per square inch or 150 newtons per square millimeter in metric units and the compressive strength is 83 kips which is 570 newtons per square millimeter well given that the highest stress we found anywhere was under 8 newtons per square millimeter or one and a half percent of this number here i think it's fair to say that we haven't overstressed the brake rotor, nor have we done any damage to it. So what were my findings? Firstly, regarding the support system, I would strongly advocate having two independent supports under the vehicle. One of them clearly needs to be a good, strong fixed support. But to my mind, no reason why the vehicle jack shouldn't provide the backup support. Much safer to leave it there than to take it out. And also taking it away can be a lot of work. My trolley jack weighs 45 kilos and it's a lot of work to manhandle it. Secondly, regarding the use of timber or dunnage in preference to axle stands, well I've given you my reasons for preferring dunnage. Now thirdly, having one of the supports underneath the brake rotor. Now I've conclusively demonstrated that for this vehicle with this rotor, Resting on a nice cushioning surface, there's no way you're going to overstress it. You can't damage it. However, I would accept that in general terms, it's much better practice to have the second support under the axle. However, if you're using dunnage, it means you're going to need a much bigger piece of timber. Something like this. A man handling that into position under the axle whilst lying on your belly is going to be a big struggle. You're probably going to end up using axle stands. Make your own choice. So there it is, my lord. My case rests there, and it's up to you, the jury, to decide whether I'm guilty as charged or not. Bye for now.